My name is Philip Bernborg. I work as a biomedical engineer here at the University Hospital in Skåne. Together with ANAR, we're going to present in-house manufactured peak cranioplasty implants and our initial experience from the hospital. Uh, right, I needed to do just a request. So thank you. Uh, so background, uh, as far as we know, we were the first to implant a completely point of care produced peak implant last year. Uh, and since then, we have also produced two more implants, which are implanted in two more patients. Uh, so in total, three patients so far. And we have a, a study for 40 patients that is currently ongoing. Uh, so, in the agenda today, we will talk a little bit about who we are. We are going to explain what cranioplasty is, for those who don't already know. Uh, a bit about the regulatory aspects that we have been facing when we are we have gone into this project. Uh, a little bit about the workflow and how we design our implants. And then a short conclusion. And then ANR is going to do a live demonstration of implant design process that we are using. So about us, we started in about 2018. We are uh, still a very small team, but currently we have 12 printers and we are four employees. So cranioplasty. Cranioplasty is the surgical repair of a bone defect in the skull resulting from a previous operation or injury. So in the in our the initial stages, uh, you need to back up, Maynard. Uh, in the initial stages, we were contact by, contacted by the neurosurgeons who, want, who wanted us to help them create implants for them. Uh, at the time, they were making implants by hand by using polymethyl methacrylate. But uh, by doing this by hand, it was kind of pretty time consuming. And it was also pretty difficult for them to create an implant that would uh, look aesthetically good for the patient, but also uh, be easy to fit in the patient's defect. Uh, but at the time they wanted us to 3D print them, but there were no available implants for medical implants at the time. So we needed to go another route. So we went for creating molds instead. So we created two-sided molds uh, and we have been using them to implant about 40 patients so far. So why peak implants? Well, uh, they allow us to do more complex designs than the molds would allow us to do. They, you could add more features that are easier to make and you could uh, also uh, create geometries which are very difficult to create using molds. And um, more importantly, they are more time-saving because in the operating room, if you need to create the molds uh, or use the implant to create, create the molds, use the molds to create implants and the time saving is about 30 minutes and that's a, that's a lot of time in the operating room uh, and in the literature we have also seen that there is fewer complications when using the peak implants compared to bone cement which is polymethyl methacrylate and why would we want to do this at point of care well the point of care allows us to do faster turnaround from referral to surgery this makes it, in theory, possible for us to do in less uh, and create an implant from patient in less than 24 hours. It also allows us to do rapid design iterations since we have a very close cooperation with the surgeons. And we also, we, a huge benefit is also that we don't need to send our patient sensitive data outside of the hospital and we can keep everything inside of the hospital's firewalls. So the most difficult part of the project was finding out uh, the regulatory aspects of the project. We needed to uh, make sure that our implants are as safe as possible, but still being able to do them at the hospital. Uh, what we needed to do was find a printer that could produce uh, implant graded materials, uh, implants. And we also needed to find an, um, a filament that could be used for peak implants. So we found the Apium printer, which is able to produce the implants and keep the 
have both the implant and the filament clean during the process. Uh, but we also needed to check that this was also the case. So we did some mechanical tests to see that our, uh, our implants were, uh, uh, were sturdy enough. Uh, we needed to do some dimensional accuracy tests to see that our implants look the same from our design to when they were finished in the printer. Uh, we did some print tests and post-processing tests to see that which geometries and uh, orientations were the most beneficial for us when we were printing. And finally, we also needed to do a purity test to see that, uh, to find out that chemically we did not introduce any, uh, any uh, byproducts into our prints. So the workflow, as we uh, probably most understand, is that we would need to do some CT imaging to get the patient uh, images. And from the images, we would create an implant. And then we would send this uh, computer-generated design to the surgeon where, where they can look at it. And in some cases, we also send some, uh, some prints that are not, uh, not medical-graded filament, of course, so that the surgeon can look at it. And if they approve of it, we will print it and then we will send it. And we will also post process it, remove supports and also sand the implants uh, as little as possible so that we don't remove too much material. And then it can be sent off to the sterilization department so that it can be sterilized and then be sent to the operating room. So the parts that are delivered to the surgeon is the sterilized implant, of course. We also supply them with an implant guide, which is sort of a dummy implant that the surgeon can use to see that the implant is actually going to fit inside the defect. And that is a, a way that we want to make sure that the, the implant is actually going to fit inside. And if it doesn't fit, then the, uh, the surgeon can easily remove some more bone and then use the, and then they can be sure that the implant is going to fit. We can also supply a cutting guide, but uh, that is an optional thing. That is in the cases where the uh, uh, where the patient has not already received an, uh, a defect, then the surgeon want to create a defect instead if they want to remove some damaged bone or something else. And uh, we also supply them with a backup mold in case something would happen with the sterilized implant. Uh, if someone were to uh, drop it and it wouldn't uh, if it wouldn't survive that or something else. And then finally, we're supplying them with a patient specific document and those that is the information about the patient and also some good to know information about the implant. So summary, uh, it's uh, feasible for hospitals to produce their own patient specific implants as we have shown. Uh, but there are a few regulatory challenges since the as in, because of the MDR, uh, but there is a but there is a good potential for hospitals to do this by themselves. And so far, we have implanted three out of forty patients. And now I'm going to hand over to Einar, who is going to show you how we design our implants. So thank you. Um, so at the Skåne University Hospital, we're really close collaboration with Medviso. Uh, I'm a, in fact the founder of the company and also uh, still an active developer of the software. Um, so I will show a live demonstration here now on how to do uh, an implant design. So we can see in the previous talk, we heard about uh, 10 minutes. So I will try to do it a complete implant design, how we do this uh, at the hospital in less than 10 minutes. So here uh, we have the, uh, do you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Good. Uh, all right. So uh, what I can do is first is open a patient database. Uh, so I load uh, this, and this is the same, this is the, the P case, uh, the first implant that we did at the hospital to show it on the real data. Uh, so here we can directly see an, an overview of the CT images and CT scan. Uh, I can then do a skull uh, segmentation, automatic segmentation. So uh, then we can visualize it in 3D so we can see uh, how the defect looks. So it looks something like this. I can make a small uh, uh, smoothing of it. 
Okay, uh, and now we're ready to generate uh, a, um, an implant design. So I go to skull reconstruction here. Uh, we need to supply the computer that the defect is on the right side. Um, so the process will be that we will mirror, mirror the healthy side to the defect side. The first step is I need to select uh, where uh, the defect is, uh, so something around here. There, okay. Uh, now, what I will do now is uh, I will adjust so I can so, so make my mirror so it fits uh, with the skull, something like this. Uh, then uh, I now generate automatically generate what will be the outside of, this, the, of the new reconstructed skull shape. Uh, so I go over that and see, do I need to make some minor manual uh, adjustments? And here, here's one example. I want to make a small adjustment here. So I want to create sort of a symmetrical looking skull here. Right, adjustment there. Here. And then finally here. So uh, with, with that, I can sort of see that I reconstructed a good looking skull shape here. So click done here. Uh, and now I'll create an implant that is uh, with thickness four millimeters and no margins. So some of the minutes goes to computer calculations. So here we have an, a, a new implant. Uh, we can see how it fits with the skull. As you can see, it looks really good. I can go for a full screen here. So you see a bit more better. You can see it from the front. See so being able to recon reconstruct and go from the back and then from the side. So something like this. Uh, okay, uh, as a, as a, to be a complete uh, printed implant, we need to have uh, holes that uh, will attach to the implant with, and also have uh, drainage holes. Uh, so I will add these two now. So I will do that by having a point tool. Simply put points along the, along the contour here. So this is really to show that with, um, if you make the software easy enough, it is possible to do this directly at the point of care that this can be done at the hospitals. So I create a curve here. Uh, I want to have my screw holes inside. So I move them in, I move them in six millimeters. Okay. And then I can go for the implant here. So I want to put uh, some holes where I can attach it. So maybe here. And these, these locations where it's good to put screw holes, this is something that we typically discuss with the surgeons uh, if there are specific constraints. That could be especially around the temporal lobes uh, or temporal region in, in the skull that sometimes uh, we don't want to generate a uh, something like this, and I drill these holes. Uh, like this. So those are holes there that I will, I will put my titanium plates uh, on to screw this implant uh, on. Uh, move this. And then here I will put some uh, of these, what we call drainage holes or so. And then, okay. So, and now I almost read the implant. The last thing I need to do is to make um, 
uh, and uh, uh, put the name on that. So, so uh, it has to be patient specific and, and labeled as, as such. So I will again use my point tool here. Okay, and then, yes, right, the patients. So mark this as a patient specific. So we use the initials and the maybe the year and send the last four digits. Uh, like this. So put the name here and then we can engrave it. And with this, I'm actually um, finished with my implant. So this is the final implant. Uh, and I'm ready to send this to the printer. Um, and again, we can sort of ask, end here with, see how it looks. So this is how it looks together, the final implant. So with that, we, I hope that you got an idea on um, our initial experience is that uh, this is actually possible to do uh, in-house at hospital. Uh, it is uh, the tricky parts are the quality management systems you need to do and um, and to keep, keep track of all uh, regulatory uh, testing and um, uh, and all these regulations. Uh, I can say that this study was formally started on just before MDR kicked in, so the, it is uh, running under MDD, uh, and um, we are we are now sort of looking in how we will do this in the future. Uh, under the MDR uh, as well. So with that, I open for questions.